Hands. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a a final edition of the Tyler Werner Show for the uh, the fall semester here at Kutztown University. Talking uh, Philadelphia sports for uh, I guess well one last time for you know another month and a half or so until uh, we come back for classes and everything and and uh, you know get the set get the schedule set up for all the shows here. Um, so without further ado, I mean. Today's show, obviously, for the Eagles, I mean, we're coming off of a a loss to the Seattle Seahawks at home. Um, the Seattle Seahawks uh, shutting down the Philadelphia Eagles. And, of course, looking ahead, this coming Sunday, so, uh, eight, well, 8.30, night, you know, a night game. We got, you know, perhaps the season on the line for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys, in, you know, to some extent. Um, on on Sunday night football this coming season, you know this coming Sunday night, the season um, could possibly be on the line, considering the uh, the circumstances that are setting up here. And I, I kind of uh, I, I mentioned last week on the show how you know even though the Eagles they were in the driver's seat, um, you know at least after beating Dallas on Thanksgiving they were. You know, ahead of the, they were ahead of the the Cowboys by a game, and you know they have the right now they have an advantage in division record, and and uh, still could at the end of the season. Uh, the, but the problem is that if the you know the Cowboys beat the Eagles, obviously, then the Cowboys kind of control their own destiny the rest of the season, and uh, essentially you have the Eagles behind the curb, and perhaps you know the Cowboys win out. Um, then the Eagles, could, well, obviously would not only not win the division, which would be a disappointment, but like I mentioned last week, there was a nightmare scenario that I brought up towards the end of the show uh, where the Eagles could even finish 11-5 and five and miss the playoffs altogether. And um, I got to say, you know, with with everything that happened this weekend, you know, not not only the, do the Cowboys win and the Eagles lose, and now they're kind of back to the same nine and four record. But uh, you look at the other teams that have tiebreaker advantages over the Eagles right now. The Arizona Cardinals they won; they're at ten wins. And uh, you know, I'll tell you what: if they get to eleven wins, then uh, that the Eagles, you know, finishing eleven and five. And uh, Dallas maybe winning the division obviously is not good for the Eagles, considering the Eagles lost to the Cardinals. The Detroit Lions, on the other hand, you know another team that picked up a win this this past weekend, and they sit at nine and four right now. Um, now they have a couple winnable games left on their schedule. Certainly, uh, they got to play Green Bay the last week of the season, but. You know, very. They're a team that could very well finish eleven and five as well. And now, obviously, you had Seattle that just beat the Eagles, that has a tiebreaker over them, and uh, could you know, looks like they could finish the season pretty strong here. Then um, they got a tough slew of games, but the way that they've been playing the last few weeks, I, I could actually you know perhaps see Seattle winning out and finishing twelve and four. But at worst, eleven and five. I think for them. And they finish eleven and five, and the Eagles finish eleven and five. You know, as far as any wild card situations goes, Seattle has the edge there now that they have the head to head over them. And uh, you know, Arizona also. And now Detroit, obviously, the Eagles didn't play him this season, but right now with conference record, you know, Detroit would have the advantage. Um, again, I mean, all of the Eagles' losses have come from the NFC and not um well obviously you know they're undefeated in the division right now but as far as other NFC teams goes um I mean well they lost to Seattle they lost to Arizona they lost to Green Bay of course and uh way back they lost to San Francisco which in hindsight is now a, a big disappointment to me considering how they very well could have won that game and now seen as how San Francisco and that regime 
um, is, you know, coming undone right before our eyes. But, uh, you know, more on that later on when we go around the, uh, the league with uh, my five impressions. Um, so, I mean, like I said, um, and I, I've said before, you know, the Eagles, they lose to Seattle, who is a, um, you know, they're an elite team. You know, they in, in the mid middle part of the season or whatever, you know, they lost to Dallas. They lost to some uh, other teams. Um, like I said, maybe they, you know, they had their chances to beat a couple of them. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, I thought it was, I, I, you know, again, throughout this season, I think it's uh, been symbolic how they lose to Green Bay. Obviously, they get, you know, they're the secondary especially and, you know, got exposed in that game, um, you know, amongst other, th- you know, Aaron Rodgers. They got an elite quarterback. They they lose to Seattle this past weekend, and the identity of Seattle, which is, well, on the obviously on the defensive side of the ball, their defense is, you know, all there and healthy now, and they're, you know, playing on all cylinders, and uh, you know they look like that team that went on that Super Bowl run last year and won it all when it was all said and done. So you know they're kind of back to elite status and. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes it's not always who you play, but when you play them. And unfortunately for the Eagles, they had to play Seattle when, uh, you know, Seattle is, you know, coming off of two straight division wins where their defense was, you know, what we're what we would expect from this Seattle defense when they're all back and healthy. And uh, and then certainly, you know, you had Russell Wilson out there, you know. Uh, running around like, you know, like the Eagles' defense was having to chase a chicken or something, like in, uh, y- you know, the Rocky series or something, you know, something like that. But uh, And I, I mean that as a compliment because, uh, you know, I've, I've said it before on this show, and um, after the Seahawks won the Super Bowl, I, you know, the very first show I even did on here on the air for Kutztown Radio, um, you know, I kind of went and said how, like, you know, don't don't sell Russell Wilson short. Um, you know, no no pun intended. Considering you know five ten, yeah, it's a obviously uh, you know, for a quarterback that was one of the things, you know, when he was getting in his drafting days and how you know people analysts were you know criticizing him for you know being too small or whatever. Um, you know, really, I think this was an example here of. Um, Russell Wilson being able to extend plays, even with, you know, not too great of receivers. I mean, you know, if Richard Sherman was on another team, I could very well uh, imagine him saying um, that the Seattle Seahawks have some mediocre receivers. Mediocre? Um, and, and, you know, I mean, Doug Baldwin, I mean, I guess that's their, their best receiver. Of course, they got rid of Percy Harvin in the middle of the season. But, um... But, I mean, anyways, I mean, at times, though, I mean, when Russell Wilson's able to extend the plays the way he did um, with his legs getting out of the pocket um, or whatever, even doing the read option sometimes, um, even if Russell Wilson's not running up the field then, you know, he's running out towards the sideline or whatever, he's rolling out of the pocket, obviously that gives uh, longer time for the uh, wide receivers to maybe get open throughout the field and I mean there was a obviously there was a big touchdown play when uh, you know of course Malcolm Jenkins got you know got caught in the you know obviously in the seam and Russell Wilson finds the open receiver in the end zone for a touchdown and that was uh, one of the examples of you know hey Russell Wilson extending a play and finding a receiver down the field Um, and then of course earlier in the game you know, there's the re, you know, kind of the read option. Um, you know, Trent Cole fell for that a couple times in this game, and uh, you know, Russell Wilson, he had that one uh, long touchdown run where he just kind of had an open lane, and you know, I'm watching that happen. I'm, I'm also wondering, you know, where the heck is Nate Allen on that play? You know what he's doing, but uh, you know, nevertheless, I mean, you give a big hole like that, and Russell Wilson you know, could potentially burn you with his legs for that. Um, and, I mean, other than that, you know, 
I mean, I, I just pointed out a couple key examples of, you know, I guess maybe some bad defensive play by the Philadelphia Eagles. But, I mean, overall, considering the fact that this offense, the Eagles offense, um, that being could not move the football at all, and, you know, we're only out there for 18 minutes, I guess, of the whole game, whereas the Seattle Seahawks, you know, just seem to have control of this game pretty much this, the whole way through. Um, considering the Eagles' defense was out there for almost 42 minutes and, and having to, ch- you know, account for Russell Wilson running around all over the place, um, the defense, the front seven, maybe minus Trent Cole, I thought played pretty well, I, to be honest. I mean, if there's any silver lining here in this game, I mean, maybe it's that, um, that, that the front seven – is pretty uh, satisfactory, and I mean, I, I you know, I, I point out Trent Cole there, and you know, I mean, again, I mean, Trent Cole, he's he's like thirty two now, he's getting a little up there in age, so. But I mean, the rest of the guys, I mean, they had to be out there forty two minutes, um, accounting for Russell Wilson, and uh, you know, they they certainly the Eagles' defense was making some plays in the, you know, even even the front three. I mean, they were, they were certainly getting pressure on them, and. You know, unfortunately, like I like I keep saying, I mean, Russell Wilson has the ability to just, um, you know, se- almost second to none ability, maybe to just suddenly, you know, just turn the other way and and run out. And you know, he's a fast guy, he's, certainly, so he's hard to chase down. But you know, I mean, Michael Kendricks got in there. He 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 forced a fumble on Marshawn Lynch. Um, I, I thought, given the circumstances for the Eagles defense, the fact that they'd be out there on the field as much as much as they were, considering the Eagles offense was oftentimes going three and out, and their three and outs if they go three and out, obviously that's you know less time off the clock considering the pace that they choose to run this offense. I, I thought given the circumstances that front seven um was you know, pretty good overall. Um, now they had to sh- obviously Marshawn Lynch. They uh, had to shut him down, and um, that was one of the key things in this game. And I mean, they did a decent job. They held him under a hundred yards. Uh, he had twenty-three carries for you know eighty or so yards. So I, I mean, you know, I guess you know maybe a, a decent day you would expect out of Marshawn Lynch. And they also had that uh, that. I don't know that that second string uh, turban, I guess that they they would occasionally bring out. Um, who is I don't know. May, it sounds like Marshawn Lynch was considering retiring after last season after the Super Bowl run, but he came back for another year. So I, you know, who knows? Maybe he retires after this season. Um, you know, we'll, obviously we'll see how the rest of things you know play out for the Seahawks. But this turban guy, whoever he was, I mean, he was. He was, you know, built like a tank for one thing. He was, he was kind of, yeah, built like Marshawn Lynch himself, um, and you know, running out of the backfield. And you know, who knows? He could be the, uh, I guess, he could be the guy to step up and, you know, be the featured back for the Seahawks in the future. I don't, you know, I guess we'll wait and see on that. Um, not to say that it's, you know, he's going to totally replace Marshawn Lynch, but um, it, it seems like that could be the. The next running back for them, the power run game. He, you know, he wasn't a, he wasn't too bad, but um, you know, obviously, I, I thought the Eagles fared, you know, not too bad against defending Marshawn Lynch. I, I thought now, you know, there was a big like third and eighteen run that they, or, or I don't know, it was like a, I guess maybe it was a third and ten, but you know, they let Marshawn Lynch get like, you know, eighteen yards on it, and you know, converting the third and ten with a run like that is just. You know that's a bit demoralizing, but um, the the third down defense, which you know obviously for the most part is a passing down, um, which obviously you know brings out the Eagles secondary into uh, you know the conversation here. The, the Eagles third down defense was was subpar in this game certainly, and you know I guess again part of it can be that you know you got Russell Wilson. And his ability to extend plays and everything, um, and again, I mean, a passing down, he finds a open receiver on this Eagles secondary, and 
uh, you know, suddenly you have conversions that, uh, you know, you wish you can have. And not only that, I mean, there were ob- a couple of obvious key penalties here on the Eagles that, um, you know, some people are going to debate. And uh, but I, I, I'm not I don't really have any, you know, energy for me to, you know, to spend on the the show or waste maybe, you know, talking about the referees and um, for the most part. Now, heading into this game, they were, uh, I th- if I'm not mistaken, this was the the referee staff that kind of just let them play on Thanksgiving as well. I, I think it was the same staff. Um, and, and the Eagles secondary, to be, you know, I guess to be fair, you know, they got away with a lot in that Thanksgiving game against Dallas. And this, this was like the same referee core and uh they they kind of let a lot go here um you know both ways but you know there were a couple uh calls on the eagles and you know i guess a couple that people have questions about um and uh you know certainly chip kelly did in during the game as the camera was showing him after some controversial plays on the sideline you know really calling out the refs and uh you know just absolutely inflamed about some of the stuff that was going on out there but um but as far as the eagles secondary goes i mean you know bradley fletcher there was that big 44 yard one on him that you know really set up the seattle seahawks for a a touchdown drive you know a touchdown play in the red zone there and you know that's unfortunate he was uh, on that play you know that was an example of him you know, staying with the receiver, but not looking back at the, you know, and playing the ball when it's in the air. And, you know, that's kind of what he got called for there, you know, getting the hands on the receiver or whatever. Um, And, you know, I guess that's one that's, you know, if you're not looking back at the ball, that's one that's going to get called against you. And, you know, that's unfortunate. Maybe if he, maybe if every now and then, maybe he would look back and and play the ball. um, Who knows? Maybe he could make some more plays than he does, you know, maybe, maybe intercept a couple more balls than he does and maybe, you know, draw fewer penalties than he does in situations like that. I don't know. But, uh, you know, we'll continue to discuss it right here in the Tyler Werner show today. Um, and the number to get in is 610-683-4859 for the, you know, this is the last time this semester, last show. And, um, you know, you can also go to facebook.com slash Tyler Werner show and, and uh, put a post, you know, on the uh, discussion post there. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, given that this is the, uh, you know, the last last show for the semester, um, you know, it's I, it's a bit unfortunate, but it's kind of, I guess the tone of it is going to be like a, you know, a cliff cliffhanger ending here to the, I guess, the season of the Tyler Werner show. And, you know, as uh, we got Dallas this coming week, and there's a lot of circumstances that, could perhaps work against the Eagles here this week that we'll talk about right here on the show today. So uh, we we hit we're hitting the first break. Um, the folder's empty as far as uh, you know. I guess the KU campus announcements, given that you know this is finals week and the semester's pretty much over. So um, so I don't have to I guess spend a couple minutes out of the show reading those. So so. Uh, But nevertheless, we'll hit the first break right here on the Tyler Werner Show on Kutztown Radio. The purpose of KUR is to provide a means of student training and experience in radio broadcasting, to provide a means of entertainment and information for the student body and community, to serve the public interest, and to be an instrument of expression for student, faculty, and community opinion in accordance with the rules of the Federal Communications Commission and KU policy. If ever you as the public should have any questions or comments about our mission, feel free to contact us through our website, kur.kutztown.edu. There you'll find a whole host of ways to contact us via our Facebook, Twitter, email, or phone numbers. Thanks for listening to the radio voice of Kutztown University, KUR. Who doesn't like to hear positive and uplifting stories today in the midst of all the bad news that's out there? The People Chronicles is a website that shares inspiring stories from Berks County and beyond. It's a community storytelling project giving voice to those who normally don't have one. You can find a story that speaks to you or share a story of your own. Check out The People Chronicles at thepeoplechronicles.com today. And you can hear the positive and uplifting stories of the People Chronicles every Thursday at 11.30 a.m. here on KUR. (laughs) 
623 on this final edition of the Tyler Werner Show for the fall semester as we are in that that week in between the uh, the Eagles game between the Dallas Cowboys and coming off of the loss to the Seattle Seahawks. So, uh, you know, unfortunately next week, you know, regardless of what happens, um, you know, whether it be another big win over the Dallas Cowboys that, you know, perhaps uh, will pave the way for another division title for the Eagles um, or whether it's a, a loss that could perhaps, you know, throw the season in jeopardy for the Eagles. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, we won't be able to talk about it next week. But, but I mean, nevertheless, I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk today about, you know, I guess what we can talk about as far as where we're at right now. And, and uh, you know, again, I mean, the Seahawks, I mean, the defense, I mean, shutting shutting down the Eagles' offense, um, I, I think it goes to show you that the limitations um, that you have, that obviously, you know, can be addressed in the in the offseason, that will hopefully be addressed, um, I guess, is to the best that the Eagles organization can. Um, obviously, you know, I say that because uh, it, it's going to be, hard to get you know the quarterback that uh I, I guess the ideal quarterback for the the chip kelly offense um you know obviously i'm kind of hinting at the the name of marcus Mariota there um I, obviously it's going to be tough to get him um and, and other than that i mean you know i don't know who else you'd get i mean it's it's debatable obviously but i mean there's other areas of this team that hopefully you know, to become an elite team, for the Eagles to become an elite team, because, you know, every time they lose to an elite team like the Seattle Seahawks and the Green Bay Packers, and, uh, you know, at the time, the Arizona Cardinals, who, you know, were playing like an elite team, certainly, uh, I, I think it's just kind of symbolic of how, you know, the Eagles, they're not quite there, and they kind of, you know, regardless of where they were at record-wise or, or whatever, you know, they kind of just get put in their place a little bit, um, as far as I'm concerned, in the grand scheme of things. Um, now, but again, I mean, you know, even if they can't get the quarterback in the draft or whatever that uh, you would hope that they could get, that could come in here right away and, you know, maybe and and uh, run the Chip Kelly offense, maybe to the, the ex- I guess, the the level of success and efficiency that you would hope. I mean... There's other areas, certainly, that they can improve upon, I think, to become an elite team. And, you know, I hate to sound like I'm, you know, I guess looking towards the offseason already, but, you know, I, I just, I, I can't help but do that when, you know, they they can't beat the Seattle Seahawks. When they get, well, they, not only they do they not beat them, but they the, the Seahawks defense just totally shuts down the Eagles offense, which you know, obviously uh, ran pretty well the week before, you know, albeit against, uh, you know, Dallas Cowboys defense that, uh, you know, I think is uh, mediocre at best. Mediocre? Yeah, I think, you know, Richard Sherman would agree with me there. But um, but anyways, uh, I, as far as there is to improve, which um, will, will definitely be the topic, you know, one of the main topics of discussion um, when the Tyler Werner show returns um, I guess in February or, or so, maybe the beginning of February, um, you know, obviously how the Se- you know we can improve the Seagulls team, and um, you know, I, I thought it was funny because I was talking to uh, Batman Wayne, who listens to the show a lot, who who I live near, and you know, he kind of he kind of joked um, how you know, like so t- you know, as bad as the Sixers are and the Flyers aren't doing too well, and you know. Uh, come, come the win, you know February or whenever when you know next semester and the, and the football season's over, you know what are you, what are you going to talk about for two hours and and um, yeah, I mean obviously it's a it's a good question when you know right now things are not looking too good for the Flyers and you know the Sixers of course, um, you know obviously they're tanking their season, but nevertheless, I mean out of nowhere they win two games this past week. So uh you know they uh they prevent themselves from making the kind of history you don't want to make uh as I I kind of mentioned last week and um they 
you know, had they lost to the Minnesota Timberwolves last week, they would have tied for the worst start in NBA history, but then you know, they come out and beat them 85 to 77. And that that game had a actually a, a comical beginning to it. Um they uh there there was a obviously they they tipped the ball up for the jump the opening jump ball. And I I don't know how this happens, but they discover that both teams are going the wrong way as they're playing the game here. And so what what they did, you know, I guess the referees, you know, realized this and then they just, you know, they totally started the game over. They, you know, make sure the teams were going the right way. I, you know, I, I don't know how that happens, but, I, you know, again, I, I guess this goes to show you how, I don't know, maybe it's a bit symbolic of how bad the Sixers and the Timberwolves are this year. But, um, you know, nevertheless, when the, when the game restarted, you know, the, the Sixers would go on to win 85 to 77. And, uh, you know, the, and then they lose the next next game to Oklahoma City Thunder. But they come back and beat the Detroit Pistons. But, you know, Pistons are a, another awful team. They beat them in overtime. So, you know, right now the Sixers sit at 2-18. And, and, you know, it's, it's hard to believe. But, um, you know, since, you know, they they have a two and one record since discussing last last week here on the Tyler Werner show the history that was basically you know kind of at stake here. So uh, I mean, really, that's you know, it's uh, I guess good good job for the the Seventy Sixers, even though you know, again, I mean, I'm sure it's you know time to they'll be going right back into the tank and and everything and. Um, they don't, again. I mean, they don't. I guess they don't want to win too many games here because uh, obviously you want to get had the best chance at getting that number one draft lottery ball and whatever. And you know, I, I guess that's the ultimate goal here. But um, it, it's nice that they can actually win a couple games here in a in a week span. And obviously, it's nice that they can uh, prevent themselves from making awful history here. Uh, you know. It's, such as starting out 0 and 19 for the you know being the first team to ever do that. So that's a, it, it's good that they can avoid that kind of history. I agree. So um so yeah that's a you know that was really that with the Sixers. I mean again as far as what we'll talk about in the winter um and you know heading into the spring, yeah, I mean it's basically that the Flyers, the Eagles off season and the I guess the Phillies when we we come around to that in April when the, that season starts and everything. Although, uh, you know, unfortunately for the you know the the Phillies season, you know, I I kind of feel like it's going to be um, about the same level of interest as the uh, the the Sixers season right now. Oh God, yeah, I mean, these are suffering and this are I, great I, I think the the Phillies are another team that might you know to to get to where they maybe elite status again in the MLB they might I, I don't know they might have to pull a Sixers kind of move themselves um but I I don't know that remains to be seen so that, that I guess that's what's on tap for the uh for the the Tyler Werner show um come time in the uh you know in February or whenever whenever we start up shows again um but yeah I mean obviously talking Eagles off season and kind of getting back to that and how this team can improve. Um, you know, I mean, for the record, I'm, I'm just, I'm done with Riley Cooper. I mean, I, I, I'm listening to the, some of the, the press conference, I guess. And since it is, uh, I guess since it is a, a times yours Tuesday, I guess we should mention times yours. Since the Eagles are, uh, of course coming off a loss. Um, we, we got to close the semester out with the times yours Tuesday, um, we'll listen. We'll listen to some of what Chip Kelly had to say in the you know post game press conference. Um, I guess after the game, and, and you know some of the things he had to say. I mean, he kind of defends Riley Cooper a little bit, um, and and just like I I don't know. He's he says how like he has uh, last year he had forty seven receptions and how right now he has forty six, um, but. You know, which you know is obviously almost, uh, you know, with a couple games better. I mean, or a couple games to spare. You know, he's already, I guess, reception-wise, where he was last year. 
but he has almost half the yardage from the research I've done. And, of course, he only has one touchdown catch the entire season. And, um, like I've said before, he has he has more drop touchdown passes slash, you know, just plays that he's blown when he could have, you know, perhaps scored on a scored a touchdown for. I mean, he has more more drop touchdown passes in that than, you know, actual touchdown receptions this year. And that's uh that's a big disappointment obviously when you, you know, you, you pay him 5 million and you you know, everything, you know, with everything in mind with the Sean Jackson, they get rid of him and the, you know, now Jeremy Macklin, he's having a great Pro Bowl season. Um, now I, you know, he had a touchdown on that one screen play, uh, that nice, you know, in, sent in motion for the Eagles when obviously they benefited from great field position from that, that, uh, you know, that bobbled, uh, punt from the, you know, the Seahawks and the Eagles had great field position there and, um, they convert on a, f- on a fourth and one play, which, you know, I, I like that they, you know, gutsy call there, but they convert, and then uh, that would set up a nice touchdown play to Jeremy Macklin. So, I, I mean, obviously, uh, Jeremy Macklin, who's, you know, obviously now, you know, owed a big payday this off season since uh, it, it'll be time for a, a, a new deal for him. Um, you know, we'll see if, you know, see if uh, he tests the free agency market or, or whatever, but um, obviously, it'd be nice for the Eagles to to keep him, um, and maybe you know replace Riley Cooper. But I mean, I, I guess I guess who knows right now because uh, Chip Kelly was sticking up for Riley Cooper, and and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't understand how they go. Some plays are they're going deep to uh, you know they're going deep down the field to a. A double covered Riley Cooper and it's you know it's like you know really you really expect him to to catch that ball um especially when it's like under thrown um and off to the side when Riley Cooper's not that fast of a guy and he's not real he's not normally the guy that goes after the ball like you would want your receiver to you know oftentimes you know and, and like interceptions throughout the season like there was um I I think I don't know if I'm thinking of one a couple of weeks ago, or maybe there's one, or maybe it was during the Green Bay Packers game. I forget when. Uh, there's just a, a pass where it seemed like the, you know, the defensive back, the cornerback, or the safety, or whoever it was, wanted the ball a lot more than Riley Cooper did. I don't know, but um, it's just like I, I just don't understand what they're doing here, trying to throw it to him deep when he's double double covered and. I think you would know enough about Riley Cooper's ability by now to know that, you know, how how is he going to come up with that that catch, especially when it's not you know someone like Aaron Rodgers throwing that pass to him or whatever. Um, I I don't know, but um, you know apparently they say how Riley Cooper's a great blocker and everything, and so you know I guess evidently you're paying you know you're paying him five million dollars just to block or I I, I don't know, but. Um, if, Hopefully they can upgrade that position in the off season. I'll be looking for them to do that. Um, you know, Jordan Matthews, his rookie season, I, you know, I, I I think has been pretty good. You know, pretty solid for him in the slot. Um, I you know, but I, I think the the bottom line is the odd man out here to me is is Riley Cooper. And um, you know, I would have I, I think I was sitting here last off season um, saying how you know before before all that happened with the Sean Jackson I was kind of saying how you know Riley Cooper was probably you know the odd man out between Jeremy Macklin and Deshaun Jackson and I guess to a lesser extent Jason Avant but um Jason Avant they got rid of it as it was and they got rid of Deshaun Jackson and they hold, held on to Riley Cooper and you know, I think for Riley Cooper's sake I mean he was pretty lucky because um I think they only really kept him, you know, I think when Jeremy Macklin tore his ACL the, during training camp or whatever before the 2013 season, you know, I think the only reason that Riley Cooper was moved into that spot and that they didn't get somebody else, somebody else is that they just, you know, they needed 
oh, you know, they needed Riley Cooper, I guess. And I, I think Riley Cooper was, you know, kind of benefited from that, that kind of circumstance there of Macklin being out for the season. But, um, but I don't know. I, I guess that, that remains to be seen um, as far as on the off, offensive side of the ball, what they can do there. Obviously, they need... Obviously, they need a better quarterback than what we have. And, you know, Mark Sanchez, I mean, against Seattle's defense, I mean, they were just uh, – certainly they were in his head. And, and um, you know, obviously he, had, he played a great game against the Cowboys. But, you know, against an elite defense that is the Seattle Seahawks defense, obviously uh, things did not turn out as as you would hope there. And um, – some people now. Some people were saying, and, and I thought it was funny that um, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, who were calling this game again um, for the Philadelphia Eagles, they towards the end of the game, when you know, I guess it was evident that the game was over. They're showing, uh, uh, of course, the camera goes to Nick Foles on the sideline. How's everyone doing? Yeah, and um, you know, they start talking about, uh, you know, I guess his status and. How uh you know that Nick Foles is you know his collarbone is is coming his healing is coming along or whatever and um but that they but that they wouldn't want him you know he wouldn't want to go out there now you know just to uh to play and you know perhaps re injure the the collarbone or whatever stuff you know yada yada um but I you know they it's funny how they show him you know towards the end of the game as if like. You know, like, oh, you know, they might want to start thinking about, you know, whether or not they can get, get Nick Foles back out there. And um, obviously, you know, that sparked, uh, I'm sure that sparked some debate out of other people. And and whenever whenever the Eagles seem to lose here, like when they lost against the Packers and now they lose against the Seahawks, it's like the same conversation kind of comes up when the Eagles struggle on offense. You know, it, it's like, you know, oh, if Foles would have, would have been out there, you know, oh, they would have done so much better. And, and, uh, y- you know, I, th- I think, I think even my dad was a little guilty of this when he was watching the game. He thought Nick Foles would have been out there and would have done better. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't totally agree with that. I mean, for one thing, I mean, my consensus on Foles is that, and I think this was evident earlier in the season is that for Foles to be, you know, really successful, which like like he was last year, he needs he needs the luxury of a, a great offensive line. Um, and uh, obviously last season that was intact, you know, pretty much straight through the entire season. And um, because obviously Foles, he doesn't, you know, even Mark Sanchez has a little more mobility than Foles in the pocket. And you know, given the pressure that the Seahawks defense was putting on Mark Sanchez. I, I I don't uh, you know I I'm sorry I don't think Nick Foles would have fared any better. In fact, he might have even fared a little worse in that in that situation. Um, now, so I mean I don't know. I mean, for the people that I guess they're saying you know out there maybe expecting Nick Foles to come back in a couple of weeks and um, I, I don't know maybe m- maybe save the season if it if it becomes you know turns into jeopardy or, or whatever. Um, you know, my response is no. Uh, no. I, I don't. You know, I, I think we, I think we saw. You know, I, I think we we saw enough of falls to, I guess, understand what I just said about. Um, you know, the offensive line has to be really good for Nick Foles to be really good, and you know, even then, I mean, there were there were other mistakes that Nick Foles was making that that uh, you know didn't even didn't have anything to do with just his you know lack of mobility i think so you know there there were other things between you know just missing receivers and not being able to throw the ball away um success, successfully enough or you know under throwing a deep ball and getting it picked off as a result you know it's it's just a, a combination of things now i think with nick Foles that you know he was kind of exposed and um you know again to beat the Seattle Seahawks team, um, uh, you know, I'm afraid you're going to have to do better than Nick Foles um, or Mark Sanchez. So, you know, that's uh, that's really how I look at, at, at it there with the, uh, the Eagles offense as far as improving the personnel. 
you know, Riley Cooper, I mean, you know, again, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of, I've seen enough of him. Yeah, and, you know, not a very productive season for him. I mean, I, I don't really care how many receptions you have. I don't care if he has the same amount of receptions right now as he did the entire last season um, when his yards, are, you know, his total yards are, like, cut in half and when he has one touchdown catch the entire season. So, um, for the most part, that's where I look at that right now. So, we'll continue, the, you know, we'll continue this, you know, break down this Eagles loss on the other side and look ahead, obviously, to the Dallas Cowboys um, round two, I guess you could call it, as the Cowboys come to Lincoln Financial Field this Sunday night for a big game that could determine, you know, very well the obviously the division winner for the NFC East this year. So 610-683-4859 or at facebook.com slash Tyler Werner Show. We'll have more to talk about right here on the other side. Do you like rock? Do you like metal? You can listen to The Pit with Mitch Lambert and Matt Davis on 1670 AM or online at www.kutztown.edu slash KUR. Every Monday from 6 to 8 p.m. Only on the radio voice of Kutztown University, KUR. Kutztown University Department of Information Technology recently launched MyKU Mobile, which can be accessed at mykumobile.kutztown.edu. MyKU Mobile provides a quick way for students to view grades, financial aid information, announcements, and schedules, all from your phone. The new site also integrates with social networking sites, enabling students to post their schedules on Twitter and Facebook without ever having to use a computer. Make sure to visit mykuku.kutztown.edu for the best way to view MyKU on your phone. It's quarter of seven on this edition of the Tyler Werner Show, the last one of the fall semester. And, uh, you know, December 9th, it's a rainy day today. Fortunately, uh, I guess, you know, some would, fortunately some would say not a snowy day here, but uh, it looks like, I don't know, there's a chance for, for snow tomorrow. I don't know, it might be borderline again as far as temperature goes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you yeah, know, it's been cold and rainy lately. I mean, last week we had some cold and rainy weather too, so um, I don't know, but... You know, see how see how things play out, but um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I guess Christmas is only less than two weeks away, and uh, I I don't know to be honest, I've, I I haven't really, I, I don't know, I, I guess you could say I'm not in any kind of holiday spirit or what I I don't know what it is. I'm just I don't know. I I think I'm just more caught up in football and everything. You know, I just think I feel like you know football and. Um, you know, just amongst other things, I guess, you know, finishing up in, on school or whatever, thinking ahead, whatever it be. Um, I don't know, I just feel like that stuff is more important right now than, um, I, I, I guess, getting caught up in any kind of holidays stuff. I don't know. Not only that, I mean, I, I, as far as this year goes, I mean, I'm not, you know, uh, for the, actually for the first time in years, um, I don't have any girlfriend to shop for, so that's uh, actually to some extent that might be a to me that's a bit of a plus. Really. I agree. Um, so I, you know, I just uh, really, I mean, it's it's like uh, at least that side of the holiday, I, I I'll barely even really be celebrating as far as the you know gift giving goes, and you know as far as uh, me and my brothers, we have like a a pact that it's like I guess it's it's more of a gift, you know, it's. You know, in some regards, it's a gift for, uh, you know, each other not to give gifts, I guess. You know, it's like, well, if, you know, you want something, you can go out and get it. And we're not spending the money on each other, you know, on one another that I guess we could spend on ourselves, I guess. I, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe some people don't like that concept. But uh, but then again, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, as far as the... Uh, I guess the real meaning of Christmas, I guess, goes, I mean, at least from my perspective, I mean, I guess that's, that's not really what it's all about anyways in the first place. And so I, you know, I, I'm not really caught up in it, I guess. And it's, but I don't, it's just one of those things where I, I just, 
I, I really don't care. And it's, I, I'm a bit ambivalent right now. And I'm just, I don't know, I'm just so caught up in football. And I, I guess that's, uh, you know, football amongst other things. And it's, you know, I guess that, uh, that does it enough for me as far as holidays go. And, you know, especially like when you have the, the Eagles on Thanksgiving, I mean, um, you know, against the Cowboys. I mean, that was like, that game it was like in of itself a holiday right there. So, um, and, you know, to some extent, I mean, certainly this next game against the Cowboys to some extent is like another holiday. Um, so I, I don't know. And I, I mean, even, you know, even just to see the Eagles in the playoffs and I, I guess in uh, that first playoff game, whether or not they can win it maybe this year, if they even get there in the first place, of course, um, you know, in of itself, again, it's like another holiday. And I guess uh, the off season, see what they do. You know, I, I don't know. It's like these little, little holidays that that sports gives us sports fans, I guess. And um, you know that maybe if for those who aren't very uh, enthusiastic about the holiday season, and I know there's a lot of cases where the holidays make you know people more miserable than you know, I guess joy about you know joyed about. I, I don't know. And sometimes it's. Sometimes sports is a nice uh, replacement for that that misery. I don't know, but but anyways, um, like I said, it it could be a it could be a even more miserable holiday season for some people out there if the Eagles don't beat the Cowboys this week. And um, you know, certainly, you know, certainly we'll get into more of that um, later on in the the seven o'clock hour tonight here on the Tyler Werner Show, but. Um, I guess before we before we go any further, we'll uh, we'll continue through the show with the with the Tyler Werner call out of the week. It's time for Tyler Werner's call out of the week. I just think somebody owes us an explanation. That's all. What's the matter with you, loser? You're a loser. Are you kidding me? Well, I have a microphone and you don't, so you will listen to every word I have to say. All right, now in the last. You know, last segment before we hit the break, I was talking about obviously how, you know, Nick Foles. You know, I, I don't think he would cut it against this Seattle Seahawks defense, and as an elite quarterback in this league, and uh, Mark Sanchez. I mean, it's like the same case. Um, you know, I, I, you know, at no point in this game did I trust, uh, I guess, Mark Sanchez to, you know, make the throws that needed to be made against this. You know this very brutal Seattle Seahawks defense, and obviously the se- you know headed by the secondary um, that is just you know off the charts good. But Michael Bennett from the uh, the Seattle Seahawks defense, you know defensive end, um, I, to me maybe took it a little too far as far as uh, Mark Sanchez goes. I mean if it if it wasn't already bad enough watching the Sanchez and the Eagles offense get shut down this week. Michael Bennett, you know, I, I after the game, let alone um, that you, you know, that you won and didn't really have any, um, any, you know, bad blood with the other team. With Michael Bennett called Mark Sanchez an imposter as QB. Now, um, let's see. It, it goes. Let's see. I want to scroll down a little bit here. Where he, he said, tell the Philadelphia police to put an APB out, Bennett told USA Today Sports. Sanchez is trying to impersonate a good quarterback. And, you know, I look at, I, I look at things like this, uh, you know, you're going to go that far. And it's like, well, what does that say about who, you, you know, you just beat then? That kind of diminishes the win, I guess, that you just got. Um, you know, not only that, I mean, it, he's the second string quarterback and. Um, when it's, I, I think he's obviously not the long-term plan guy. Now, uh, you know, and Michael, you know, as far as uh, referring to Michael Bennett here, it's like, you know, I think to myself, like, what if, what if we had Russell Wilson? And you would, you know, you would chase him down, for instance. You, you know, it'd be a much different. You know, maybe it'd be a a much different spin on here. It, you know, it's it, it's really easy to say that. You know, after obviously after winning. Um, and, and shutting down the Eagles' defense, you know that. Yeah, Mark Sanchez um, is trying to impersonate a good quarterback or whatever. But I, I mean, it's like, you know, really, I, I think that might be taken a little too far. 
And again, it just it kind of diminishes who you just beat then. Um, so I I don't really understand what the whole idea of that was. And it's, you know, I, I know maybe this is a team that trash talks or whatever, I you know, during the game or whatever. But after the game, after you won, um, you know, I, I think to myself, like, what did Mark Sanchez, you know, do to you? I mean, I, I don't know. This guy's like, you know, he, he's kind of thrown out there and, um, nobody's expecting him to be a great quarterback. And I, I, I just, I don't totally get it here. And it's kind of just, um, you know, maybe Michael Bennett, you know, wants like extra attention here or something, but, um, you know, not even like, you know, not even like Richard Sherman said anything like this after the game. Uh, I actually, I actually heard some of what Richard Sherman had to say, um, about defending the Eagles, um, offense and uh i actually had actually a lot of agreement with what he said um he kind of said like you know we kind of just went out there and did our thing because um there was no kind of threat out there like you know deshaun jackson as far as uh speed goes or, or whatever and um you know obviously you got riley cooper out there and um you know of, of course what is riley cooper mediocre yeah mediocre at best and maybe not even you know, I guess he's a blocking wide receiver, as as uh, you know, Chip Kelly would say. You know, he's a great blocker. I guess that's the best thing about Riley Cooper. I don't, I don't know, but you have. Uh, but I mean, Deshaun Jack. I mean, I know Deshaun Jackson is like uh, you know a good friend of Richard Sherman's, but um, you know, you know, he kind of. Uh, I guess I I heard a little bit of what he had to say um, after the game. He said, you know, there was. There was nobody, you know, personnel-wise that really, um, I guess, in the as far as the receiving core goes, um, that that scared him. Now, you know, Jeremy Macklin he's a pretty, you know, reliable, decent wide receiver, but um, you know, against Richard Sherman, obviously that's a little difficult. And um, with the way that the Seattle Seahawks secondary plays, um, you know they 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 play pretty smart and they know that you know they knew what they could get away with um in this game as far as you know contact goes and you know when i guess when you could apply the contact and get in the receiver's face or whatever um you know they knew what they were doing but there was nobody you know again i mean that that scared i guess scared them and um you know i i was i kind of agree with um you know what Richard Sherman would have to say there, but Michael Bennett here, I mean, taking a little too far, like, I mean, to go on and say, you know, tell the Philadelphia police to put an APB out. Sanchez is trying to impersonate a good quarterback. It's like, you know, you know, seriously, like, I don't know, that's a little too, uh, to me, that's taking a little too far, especially after, you know, you've won the game. I I, I don't know. Um, not only that, I mean, your head coach, I mean, Pete Carroll, uh, I mean, Mark Sanchez is like, you know, I, I guess one of his boys in a sense. I mean, uh, I don't know, Pete Carroll, uh, obviously before the game, Pete Carroll having a, you know, rendezvous with Mark Sanchez. And, of course, he he was he was wishing that Mark Sanchez didn't, uh, you know, didn't, you know, I guess leave USC or whatever as soon as he did and maybe, you know, wanted, to, wanted him to stay another year or whatever and before going to the NFL. But, um you know that was uh you know that, that was really that i guess um but uh but i mean anyways um i guess moving on here a little bit um before we hit halftime on the Tyler Werner show um well uh i guess to you know i guess give an idea of what's coming up ahead um we got around the you know around the league my top you know top 5 impressions after this week always you know an interesting set of of games with other teams. Um, we'll look into the, the Dallas Cowboys, uh, I guess, you know, that game coming up and, you know, also specifically the NFC and some of the other things on the table right now for, uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, different teams that if they win, um, what that could mean for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, if the Eagles finish 11 and five, you know, that whole nightmare scenario that I brought up last week, uh, we'll, we'll have a, I guess we'll have like a nightmare scenario update coming up, I guess, later on. I guess that, that makes any sense what I'm saying there. Um, 
And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the F Flyers have a game tonight, and the puck drops um, in a couple minutes. I think it's seven, oh if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, yeah, we'll see uh, see what they can do with, with a, another go-around tonight with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, you know, hopefully they can beat them. Yeah, well, maybe we'll uh, we'll discuss a little Flyers later on. Um, I guess if we have time, maybe give scoring updates. But uh, you know, they're they're coming off another win against the Los Angeles Kings, which was their only win since um, last beating the the Columbus Blue Jackets back on uh, November the twenty second. Of course, the Flyers. You know, last week they were riding a a losing streak, and you know they lost six straight. Um, they lost. Uh, well, I guess they had a game against the Anaheim Ducks, which uh, came to the, you know, came down to a shootout. And uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure anybody can guess, you know, what ended up happening there. Um, so, you know, overtime loss there. But uh, other than that, I mean, the Flyers. For whatever reason it is, I mean, once again, they beat the Los Angeles Kings in Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, I guess a good win for the Flyers there. But uh, certainly they still have they still have a lot of work to do, I guess, is the the cliche I'll throw out there. And and uh, that that starts with, you know, hopefully beating the Columbus Blue Jackets to, tonight, who are, uh, you know, they're basically the same record as the Flyers. Um uh, you know, give or take a couple of overtime losses. So, um, you know, that we'll keep you up to date on that. Um, if, you know, maybe the Flyers get out to an early lead or, or something. So we have that. And I guess uh, before um, before we hit the last break, I'll bring up the, uh, the on-air fantasy results. Um, of course, last, uh, you know, last week I said how, you know, this week obviously there's not really a point in, picking teams this week because there's no show next week to even you know talk about it but so this was uh this was the last um edition of on-air fantasy football um between you know with producer tyler fleming and myself and um you know there was some interesting picks we had i mean he had drew Brees at quarterback who didn't have too good of a week whereas i had aaron Rodgers, who had a you know a pretty high scoring affair last night against the Atlanta Falcons and you know amongst other interesting picks um now if I'm not mistaken this was the the closest I, this is the only game I could ever think of um all semester that was this close between Fleming and I it was a it was a one point game and and the winner was 40 to 39 Fleming you won by one point as uh and I, you know, I, I, I think the guilty, the guilty pick here, I guess that I made, was the San Francisco 49ers defense, who, well, the, the team they they not only lost to the Oakland Raiders, but uh, you know, certainly they, this defense that once was ferocious, obviously, and you know, you would have thought maybe would have shut down, you know, the Oakland Raiders a little more than they did. Um, they were my, they were the Achilles heel of my team. So, uh, and it just, yeah, not only that, I mean, it, it just looks like that regime is just, uh, you know, really on, on their, uh, really on the way to a, a downward spiral right here. But, um, you know, I guess, uh, I guess more on that maybe later or, or on another time, but, um, but yeah, so that was the, uh, that was the final. So a good, uh, a good last go around there and, and yeah, I, uh, you know, again, I mean, I kind of. I already did the the Tyler Werner show call out of the week, but I think uh, you know the 49ers certainly. The, if if this was uh, you know if I was doing this show out of San Francisco, maybe uh, maybe they'd be getting called out this week. But but that was that. So um, so yeah. Without further ado, we'll we'll move on um, into halftime right here on the Tyler Werner show six one zero six eight three four eight five nine or at facebook dot com slash Tyler Werner show. Ways to get in right here on the Tyler Werner Show on Kutztown Radio. KUR Kutztown. Ben, ben, voice of Kutztown University. KUR. What are the different ways I can tune into KUR? Well, there's 1670 AM. Streaming online at kur.kutztown.edu. 
at select times of the day on Service in Electric Burke Channel 24. Hometown U Telecom Channel 28. And Service Electric Lehigh Channel 266. Or on your smartphone using a free app like TuneIn. Or on any phone simply by dialing 610 465 7860. KUR can also be heard in select campus buildings like the MSU, Rickenbach, Stratton, Rec Center, and Keystone at 88.3 FM. It's the top of the hour, and you're listening to the radio voice of Kutztown University, KUR Kutztown. We can be heard on campus at 1670 AM throughout Eastern Berks County as nominated for Best College Radio Station at an institution with under 10,000 enrollment and winner of Best Use of Social Media, your news leader in Northeastern Berks County, KUR Kutztown. The KUR News Time is the top of the hour. I'm Mike Regensberger. In October, Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education was awarded a third Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Programs grant through the U.S. Department of Education. The seven-year, $23.7 million grant was awarded to 14 institutions of the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. Now we learn that part of the grant will be used to fund KU's efforts to partner with regional school districts and assist underrepresented students in learning about higher education opportunities and eventually attend college. Currently, the Gear Up grant will support working with 2,774th 7th graders from the Allentown School District, the Harrisburg School District, and the School District of Philadelphia. And KU sophomore Corey Bechtel has earned a spot in the prestigious Forest Wood Cup Bass Tournament from October 20th through 23rd, 2015 on a lake in Hot Springs, Arkansas. The tournament is the nation's premier bass event featuring the top 45 pros and co-anglers in the nation. Bechtel qualified for the event with a ninth place finish last month in the Wheeler Lake Invitational in Wheeler Lake, Alabama, where he caught a three-day total weight of 15.08 pounds. He competes as a co-angler. Congratulations, Corey Bechtel. Checking KUR Sports. KUR would like to remind you that throughout winter break, for any late-breaking sports scores and news from your KU Golden Bears, make sure you log on to KUBears.com. Monsoon Mike, he tells me that this dreary weather is going to continue through the end of the week. Watch out for some slick spots. and Sometimes we can have some wet snow, sleet, freezing rain mixed in as well with all of the other stuff. Definitely not one of the banner weeks here in Berks County. For late-breaking news, weather, sports, and traffic, sometimes before we can even get it live on the air, make sure you like our award-winning Kutztown University Radio Facebook page or on Twitter at, at KU Radio. From KUR News, I'm Mike Regensberger. Any views or opinions expressed on KUR are not necessarily those of Kutztown University. Kutztown University Student Government, Kutztown University Student Services Incorporated, KUR staff and management or other affiliated organizations. Seven oh six, right here in the Tyler Warner Show, and uh, it's time to go around the NFL as we we always do here throughout the football season during the fall semester here, and uh, you know give some top five impressions of other games that happen around the league uh, outside of the Philadelphia Eagles game this past week. So let's take a look around here and start off with the Dallas Cowboys, who you know they. Got back on track here um, after losing to the Philadelphia Eagles big time on Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, they beat the Bears, I mean, on the road. I mean, obviously the, the Bears are not a very good football team. And, you know, they got a bad defense and, and uh, you know, amongst other things. Um, of course, Brandon Marshall was uh, actually, you know, he, he had a, he had like a broke, you know, a couple broken ribs or whatever. He had to. So he had a he was escorted out by you know to the hospital after that game. So uh, yeah, certainly uh, I guess best of luck and uh, you know best wishes for for him recovering as he's now done for the season. Um, so the Cowboys get the win, they get back on track, and with the Eagles' loss now, of course, they're both at nine and four, and a lot is at stake this Sunday against them. And of course, we'll we'll discuss more um, throughout the seven o'clock hour here on the Tyler Warner Show. Now next we got the Pittsburgh Steelers, who just you know against the division rivals, this, the Cincinnati Bengals, this past week. 
Um, the Steelers are definitely now, uh, they're in a pretty good position right now to possibly get one of those wild card spots um, in the AFC right now uh, with all those other teams that maybe drop down to seven. And, you know, there are a bunch of, there are six, seven, and five teams, I guess, um, put it that way, heading into this week. The Steelers were one of them. They're one of the few teams that moved to eight and five um, as they beat the Bengals 42 to 21. And the Bengals just totally collapse in the fourth quarter. And the Steelers lay 25 on them. Steelers, uh, you know, with a big win right there. For, you know, and, and who knows, depending what happens here, I mean, leaves the door open for the Steelers or maybe even the Ravens to get in there and maybe uh, retake a division lead. Who knows? That remains to be seen. But um, going further along here, we got the Carolina Panthers. Who, you know, yes, I mean, at 4 8 and 1, and with the, you know, the Falcons and the Saints now both 5 and 8, you know, they're, who knows? I mean, Falcon, or, I mean, the Panthers, they blow out the Saints in the, once again, in the New Orleans Superdome. This is their fourth straight home loss now, if I'm not mistaken. You know, what was once home field advantage, now talk about home field disadvantage, I guess you could call it. As the Panthers just go out there and they just blow their doors off 41-10 to 10 out of nowhere. And so, I mean, in essence, I mean, they're like, I guess, a half game behind right now. The, the Saints and the Falcons, uh, I guess, however you want to look at it. But um, obviously, news broke earlier today that Cam Newton, you know, had a, a couple of, you know, broken ribs, if I'm not mistaken, in the car, in, you know, in a car accident today. So... You know, once again, I mean, another uh, another uh, shaky situation right there um, for, well, obviously this time, you know, quarterback here, the Carolina Panthers quarterback. So, um, you know, well, best wishes for Cam Newton, I guess, as well um, in, in recovering. And, and uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens down the road here, uh, what his status will be for the next, uh, you know, the upcoming games down the stretch here. So, even though it's a... I guess a crap division. I mean, a big win for the Carolina Panthers, nevertheless, as they could still, um, at 4 8 and 1 right now, they could find a way in the playoffs. It's hard to believe. Um, now, going further down here, the Baltimore Ravens, they get a big win against the, the, the Miami Dolphins in Miami this past week. Defense playing pretty well. Um, second, you know, second, third, and fourth quarter, they were pretty pretty solid obviously and shut the Dolphins down and uh, the Ravens here were able to get a 28 to 13 win which was key in uh, kind of separating them from the pack a little bit and helping them go to eight and five um, and now now they stand eight and five along with the Steelers and the Chargers so I mean as far as the the last wild card spot goes I mean it's kind of up in the air, but you know the, the last two, you know the, the two wild card spots goes. It's kind of those three teams in the driver's seat, um, and then you got the, of course, the Bengals kind of hanging there at eight, four, and one as well with the division lead. So, um, you know, out of those two playoff spots, I mean, you know, the Steelers, the Ravens, they might be fighting for it, and uh, even the Chargers. I mean, they're going to want to finish strong here after losing to the the uh, Patriots this past week. So. Um, we'll see what happens there, certainly. Now, uh, lastly, this was a... Obviously, this, this was a, a key win for the Arizona Cardinals. You know, beating the Kansas City Chiefs. They were down to the Chiefs. Um, actually, 14-3. to at ha There's 14-6, to I'm sorry, at halftime. But the Cardinals' defense shuts, shuts down the Chiefs in the second half. And uh, now with... Jonathan Skelton out there. Now they're, you know, third string quarterback, I guess you could say. Um, leads them, you know, to a big win. And, you know, they're probably, again, I mean, they're probably one win away from um, probably locking down a spot in the playoffs this year. Um, as, again, they're one of those teams that has a, a tiebreaker over the Eagles. And, you know, one more win for the Cardinals, and they will probably be going to the playoffs this year. So a, a big win for them, and that you know, in essence, that kind of uh, that kind of I don't know, maybe uh, hurt the, the the Kansas City Chiefs and their chances of making the playoffs uh, dramatically. 
as they're, uh, you know, there's five teams now, I think, that are seven and six in the AFC, and they're one of them. Um, you know, four of those seven and five teams from last week fell down to seven and six, and then the Houston Texans, um, they moved up to seven and six. So those are the teams, like, right now that are on the outside looking in, and uh, so that was a big win for the Cardinals. But, um, you know, other honorable mentions, I mean, obviously the Patriots going to, going to San Diego and, and beating them on Sunday night football. Uh, obviously that was a big win to get them back on track. And, uh, you know, after losing the Packers the week before. And, I mean, you know, I guess you want to look elsewhere. I mean, you know, last night, I mean, credit to the Atlanta Falcons for hanging in there in the second half. I mean, almost making a comeback against the Packers. But, um, you know, then again, I mean, you know, the end of the game, um, what does, you know, what what do the Packers and Aaron, Aaron Rodgers um you know what what do they end up doing i mean they uh you know they when when it matters most i mean they they shut down the falcons and they uh you know they just kind of run the clock out and and uh you know get a you know yet another win um at the atlanta falcons uh, or i'm sorry at lambeau field this you know against a a competitive atlanta falcons team in there you know give them credit but, five letters here but uh yes R E um, L A so yeah, I mean that's uh, and yeah. Speaking of those five letters, that's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, I guess after this week, now that classes are coming to an end, and uh, yeah, I mean obviously I'll be uh, keeping busy, keeping track of sports and 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 doing other things. But um, but you know certainly on this last edition of the Tyler Werner show for the the fall semester, um, you know we're we're stuck between the the Seattle Seahawks loss and a. A tough, um, a, you know, a tough set of circumstances that the Eagles are going to come, you know, they're going to play against this coming week against the Dallas Cowboys. Now, um, and we'll start, now that we've gone through, you know, thoughts around the NFL, we'll uh, we'll start going through, you know, some of these, uh, some of these, you know, possible disadvantages here that the Eagles are facing. Now, now first of all, um there's a, there's one statistic out there, um, you know. I guess you can call it, you know, playing the Seahawks takes a toll. Um, now, since Week Seven, teams are zero and seven the week after they played the Seattle Seahawks. So this is not obviously this is not a great omen for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, you know, I, I guess you could say, uh, yeah, playing the Cowboys at home. Um, but and, and you know, ironically, the last team. Uh, I guess that one after playing the Seattle Seahawks um, was the Cowboys, but you know, then again, I mean, that was against the Giants, and we kind of uh, uh, we kind of saw where where their season went. And of course, they finally, the Giants finally snapped their losing streak for what it's worth, um, albeit over the the Tennessee Titans. So I mean, um, you know, then again, I mean, that's uh, you know that that doesn't really say much, I guess, but um, but the Ram, you know. Dating back to week seven, uh, the Rams, the following week they lose after beating the, upsetting the Seahawks, we should say. Um, the Panthers, they lost as well. Then again, I mean, the Panthers are not very good. The Raiders, same same deal there. Obviously not very good. They lose the next week. Um, but then again, that's almost, that's, that's kind of almost what the Raiders do every, almost every week anyways. But of course, uh, that uh, that wasn't the case when they beat the the San Francisco 49ers this past week, um, and and you know Colin Colin Kaepernick sitting there in the press post game press conference with his you know beat headphones around his neck or whatever those things are, um, and you know kind of just saying I I didn't play well and you know he's he's in certainly he's in quite a funk right now and is along along with that whole organization. Now week ten. It was the Giants, of course. You know, another team that, you know, again, for the most part, that's what that's what the Giants have been doing since the Eagles, you know, gave them that that big loss way back. Uh, the Giants have been basically losing, and of course, they just beat the Titans, and um, that doesn't say a whole lot. Once again, um, the, Chief, the Chiefs, uh, 
of course, after the Chiefs beat the Seahawks, um, then the Chiefs kind of went into the tank a little bit, and uh, they, they got the, you know they kind of fell into a bit of a hole since, and now they're at seven and six, and they're on the outside looking in. Week twelve, week twelve was the Arizona Cardinals, who of course the uh, the Seahawks beat, and uh, they they have another game with the Cardinals um, coming you know a couple weeks after the 49ers, but. Um, and, and of course, you know, the Cardinals now, they've been missing Carson Palmer. And like, like I've said before, I mean, they're kind of, uh, they're kind of just fighting to hang on the rest of the way here. They need to, I mean, they, they just need to do the best they can with, I guess now Jonathan Skelton, who, um, of, of course was, you know, the, the backup behind Drew Stanton. So, um, you know, we'll see if they can hang on. And then the 49ers who, they didn't put up much of a fight on Thanksgiving night, um, and you would have thought that they would have beat you, they would have beat the Oakland Raiders, but um, nevertheless, that's just, that's the statistic. Zero and seven since Week Seven. Um, teams playing, you know, after playing the Seattle Seahawks, whether they beat the Seahawks or whether they lost, um, the next week they come out and they lose. So we'll we'll see if that uh, we'll see if that. I guess that trend continues here for the Philadelphia Eagles here. That's that's one of the circumstances or one of the statistics, I guess, go, you know, that did not favor the Eagles here. They're coming off playing the Seahawks and certainly it was a physical game. Um, now, here's a I guess here's another th- another thing I'll, I'll bring up. Another th- thing against the Eagles here. Um, is that the defense was out there for 42 minutes and you know, you know, again, granted, I mean, they the Eagles put up a good fight and they um you know they they even they even left a chance for the Eagles to get back in the game late in the game but you know all day long the Eagles with the exception of like one drive when um you know Zach Ertz had that that critical touchdown play um you know it was it was nice to see him get involved in the game um with the exception of that they didn't really move the football d- down the field at all this game and and that was a shame um, you know they benefited early in the game from that that bobbled punt, and uh, they were able to you know get a touchdown out of, out of that short field. Then, but other than that, they just you know it was like a a career low for Chip Kelly here in his offense and his his run here so far with the Philadelphia Eagles. So, um, and again, I mean I, th- I think that says a lot about Seattle's defense, but um, you know again it also says about some of the things that the Eagles lack on on the offense and. Um, you know, at least when it comes to playing the Seahawks and when it comes to having to throw against them, because you know they were, for the most part, they were um, they were defending the run pretty well. That, that's the bottom line. I mean, they were gonna, you knew that's what they were gonna do. They were gonna try to bottle up the run game um, and force Mark Sanchez to throw against this def- you know this secondary that is obviously you know the best in the league with. Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and, you know, Earl Thomas, uh, you know, obviously just the lights out, you know, like the Legion of Boom defense, as they would say, and, uh, you know, whatever else you want to call it. But, um, you know, I I think uh, obviously, you know, it it doesn't help that they have Riley Cooper out there as, you know, wide receiver number two. Um, But, you know, it it would have been nice to, um, and I, I was listening on the way, I was listening, you know, before the show. I was listening to the, you know, the uh, the weekly conversation with Sal Palantonio and, and Mike Missinelli on, on the Mike Missinelli show, and um, you know he and uh, you know before I, I guess Mike even brought anything up. I mean, um, Sal Palantonio said it would have been nice if they could if they could have gotten Darren Sproles into space more. And done more with him, maybe in the passing game. Um, I agree. And yeah, I mean, Mike kind of agreed with that. And you know, before you know, both of, both of them knew that they had that that similar opinion. And I, I was I was I was thinking the same thing after the game. Like, you know, he's well, he's the fastest guy on the defense, obviously, and or I'm sorry, on the offense. And obviously, that's maybe one of the ways we could have gotten. Um, you know, maybe created some some offense that you weren't creating elsewhere on this, uh, you know, in this game throughout, you know, against this defense. 
they you know there was a drive where they tried handing it off to him a little bit but um you know they were again they were kind of just shutting down the run game pretty well but they uh you know it would have been nice to see him do some more um wheel routes to Darren Sproles and they could you know they could have also done more more of that also with LaShawn McCoy but for whatever reasons they didn't really do any of that um and like I said earlier they that one uh that one play they put Jeremy Macklin in motion and they score a touchdown with and basically throughout the rest of the game they didn't do any of that um you know it worked earlier and I I don't know why they didn't maybe try doing more of that throughout the game when other things weren't working at all I don't know just um play calling could have been better here and um I don't know there could have been maybe more diversity here in the approach but um you know at least to maybe figure out a way to move the football a little bit when you know I I think part of it was you know the way they were shut down um part of it was they they weren't diverse enough on offense as far as what they could have done with maybe Darren Sproles in the passing game and um, even LaShawn McCoy and Jeremy Macklin, but um, I, I don't know. They they, they just didn't uh, really mix it up very well, I guess. And, and uh, it, you know, again, it, it doesn't help when, um, you know, you, you got Riley Cooper out there, you, you know, trying to get the ball to him deep in double coverage, which, you know, I, I don't know why. And um, I, I don't know. It was just – it felt pretty one-dimensional – of, a, of an approach here and um you know obviously it would make it would make matters easier if you had better personnel like you know i continue to say that but um but they don't so uh at, at least in, 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 in at least in a couple positions where they could you, you know obviously use an upgrade against an elite defense so so um so yeah that's that's really that right now if i'm and if i'm not mistaken we have a another break to get to so um, we'll get to that, and we'll talk. You know, talk more of this, uh, more of these scenarios for the, you know, the Dallas Cowboys and the Philadelphia Eagles uh, coming up right here in the Tyler Werner Show on Kutztown Radio. Hi, we are Pack One Eighty Three, and we love listening to KUN. Is my favorite color. What's yours? What's yours? Red is my favorite color. What's yours? What's yours? Well, yeller is sweller for this little feller. And me, I'm keen on green. So what's your favorite color? Tell us, please. Kids will spend 20 minutes listening to songs like what's this. What's your favorite color? Tell us, please. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite? How about two minutes to brush their teeth? Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. For fun two-minute videos to watch while brushing, visit 2min2x.org. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. A message from the Partnership for Healthy Mouths, Healthy Lives and the Ad Council. Seven twenty-six, right here in the Tyler Werner Show on Kutztown Radio. Um, now we have, uh, like I said, we have a a Flyers game going on right now. Uh, the puck dropped at seven, still uh, scoreless right now, about midway through the first period. But hopefully, you know, around this time last year, the Flyers started to pick things up a little bit. So you know, I guess hopefully they can do that right now. Um, as we move through, you know, move through the holiday season here. Um, but yeah, scoreless right now in the first period in that game. Now, uh, there was, uh, I guess before we go a little further here, there was, uh, of course, uh, Tiger Woods actually made his, his return to the golf this past week. Yesterday I did pull out. Yeah, actually, um, you know, I guess for, yeah, that was a bit of an interesting story, I guess, throughout the weekend outside of other things. But, um, you know, apparently he was, you know, he was under the weather this past week, you know, um, and, and I, you know, I, I, I'm reading this article here and, I, you know, again, it's, you know, under, under the weather, former world number one golfer, you know, struggles to get 
the words out, speaking to reporters and reveals he was sick on the course during Hero Word World Challenge. Now I wasn't I, I didn't watch I didn't see any of this, but um, you know uh, apparently he, he like threw up on the course and oh my god um, I I don't know, but um, I was uh, I was listening last night to in the po- one of the post round interviews of Tiger Woods and, and you know he, he's very hor you know his, his voice is like very hoarse and everything but it I, like I don't know I mean it almost sounds like he was like faking and I mean I'm not trying to like you know stir up controversy here but um I'll, I'll play the audio of it in a second it, it even I don't know, even almost like sounds like uh like Bruce Springsteen almost in his uh, the way he's I don't know he's really hoarse in this interview and he he kind of discusses um what was going on and uh, you know I guess it, it, how he was um how he was f- f- you know fighting I guess to you know battling this nausea and sickness and everything and um you know I guess you know actually I, ironically he 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 did not pull out here in this case Yesterday I did pull out. yeah actually he he did you know i guess it's more like you know the other day he he didn't pull out of this and i guess he was playing through this but but let's listen to the uh this tiger woods all you know about 30 seconds and i i don't know i mean i i i guess uh i guess you be the judge out there listening on i guess how uh you know how real you know maybe authentic this sounds from tiger woods well, I was <laughs> I wasn't doing too good at the beginning, but um, I I thought I could could hang in there. If this fever just broke, I thought I'd be all right. And it uh, it finally broke on the front nine. No, I just didn't have the initially didn't have the explosiveness. You know, I was just pretty slow. And uh, um, as a as a round built built on, I started to feel a little bit better. <laughs> okay, so that was a. Uh, that was what that. I guess that sounded like. In the, I, I don't know. It just. It, it sounds a little odd. I guess. I. I don't know. I'm not. Uh, um. I, I'm not totally sure. I mean, I guess whether it was. Uh, you know how sick he really was or whatever. And I, I. I guess it's. It's tough to. Tough for me to say. But. Um. I don't know. It just sounded. I don't know. You. you out there listening. I guess you. Uh. You be the judge. As to how. Uh, you know. Authentic that was and. I don't know because you know he's been known in the past for you know in the past year with his whole back situation and you know he'd be doing great and then all of a sudden you know um you know it almost seems like he would like totally like weasel his way into um faking like a, a back injury when he was doing you know when he started playing bad or whatever or maybe over exaggerating I, I I don't know but um so that was uh that was that at least in the the golf world this past past week I guess with Tiger Woods making a return but I you know I guess I guess not for too much because he wasn't playing too well anyways as it was and um you know th- things as far as him winning another major goes I mean you know and him getting up there in age I mean things uh continue to look more gloomy for him as to uh w- winning a- another major goes again and certainly, you know, it's tough when uh, Rory McIlroy had the kind of year he had, and you know, he kind of uh, seems to be, a, you know, kind of back on the right track as far as you know his young golfing career goes. So, so uh, yeah, that was uh, that's that. Now, uh, getting back to the the Philadelphia Eagles um, and everything there. I mean, obviously, the other, I guess, uh, things that do not favor the Eagles here as far as factors heading in, into this game. Um, obviously, you know, for whatever reason it is, the Dallas Cowboys have been good on the road this, you know, this year. They're, for whatever reason, they're, they're undefeated on the road. And, um, now, I mean, that includes some games, you know, against some weak teams, obviously, but, um, one of, obviously one of those road wins was the Seattle Seahawks. Um, you know, I guess to be fair, that was, uh. Uh, a bit of you know maybe a bit of the team you know the banged up Seahawks team that it was then but um and that was the Cowboys at all cylinders whereas um th- that was obviously what the Eagles got on Sunday night against the Seattle Seahawks I mean that seemed like the Seattle Seahawks on all cylinders um all back healthy and 
um, you know, just playing like the, the Seahawks that um, that they were late last season and into the playoffs that went, you know, they went 13-3 and three and, um, you know, kind of ran the table throughout the playoffs. So, um, you know, th- that's uh, another one of the circumstances that the, the Cowboys, for whatever reason, they've been good on the on the road this year. Now, now they also have three extra day. You know, they played Thursday night against the Bears, so um, you know that's that's given that's given them th- you know three extra days to you know see where they went wrong against the Eagles against Thanksgiving. You know, break things down, and you know, obviously, this is a to some extent a bit of a revenge situation for the Cowboys. Obviously, after getting embarrassed um, on that kind of you know, I guess big stage if you want to call it on Thanksgiving night, um, you know, losing that bat 33 to 10, just getting embarrassed. Um, so I, you know, obviously, uh, there's a lot of circumstances right here that don't favor the Eagles. I mean, uh, and then again, you got the, the fact that the Eagles, um, you know, they just, you know, they, they played a, they might be a little beat up after this game against the Seattle Seahawks. I mean, who knows? Um, now they didn't really suffer any injuries or anything, but uh, so I, I guess that's that's a good thing, um, especially with the way the the Seahawks hit hard and you know they they're you know Seahawks are a great you know tackling team. They they're not a team that misses too many tackles and um, but again certainly the Eagles defense they were out there. I mean they're chasing you know Russell Wilson around and um, you had Marshawn Lynch out there and and. Uh, you know that 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 turban, that second string running back. You know, two uh, two guys that'll you know they'll, they'll break tackles and they'll they'll really try to bust through uh, the the running lanes. And you know they were gang tackling Marshawn Lynch, and um, I think they did a decent job of him for the most you know defending the run for the most part. Um, but certainly they can take a toll. I mean, you, you know Lynch carried it twenty three times and. Uh, uh, you know, he caught a couple passes as well, but so I mean, obviously that's uh, certainly that can that can hurt the defense a little bit. Um, so heading into this game, when you got to defend Des Bryant, um, you know, we'll see how that you know see how that plays in. You know, with the Eagles secondary, certainly, um, you know, see if uh, Demarco Murray see if maybe they they're able to do a little more with Demarco Murray in this game. I don't know. We'll see if, if they can run the ball. Um, effectively with him, um, although you know, again, I mean, for the second straight week here now, I mean, against two, you know, top five running backs in the league, um, you know, it, it is kind of pleasing that the Eagles were able to uh, contain the run game, you know, to a, a decent extent and um, not let the game, not let the running game get out of hand, um, you know, against two great running backs. So uh, that's a good sign. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as other things goes, I mean, um, obviously the, the, the Dallas Cowboys on Thanksgiving, they clearly, they, uh, did not like this pace that the Eagles offense runs. Um, and, and I mean, not only that, I mean, uh, you know, on the other hand here, I mean, um, the, the Dallas Cowboys defense is nothing like the Seattle Seahawks defense that the, the Eagles just saw this past week. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if you know, see if maybe Mark Sanchez bounces back a little bit. Um, see if uh, Lashawn McCoy can maybe have a bit more of the you know the kind of game he had against the Cowboys a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, because again the Seahawks defense they they bottled him up pretty well, and uh, you know again I mean it, I I don't know they could use Darren Sproles a little more. I mean I know they've been. Very conserv, you know, they've been pretty conservative on him. Um, you know, I I can understand that he can't, you know, be out there carrying a heavy workload, but um, you know, I mean, they could still use him more in the passing game. And again, I mean, I uh, I don't know where that's all that's gone, and and I don't know. We'll see. Uh, they started to use Zach Ertz a little more in the passing game this past week. I mean, I I feel like I've been. Um, even said the name Zach Ertz in two months on this show for whatever reason, because you know they want him to be more, they want him to be a better blocker or whatever, and he's not 
a great blocker, but I, you know, I, I I don't know there. I mean, um, I, I I don't know why you drafted him then if he's not a great blocker and you wanted him, you know, you want him to block most of the time. Um, but you know, see, we'll see if maybe they do more here with the uh, I guess uh, these other guys. I mean, I guess I'll you know on one hand. The Eagles have struggled in the red zone. I know that's been one of the problems here um, with this Eagles team offense. Uh, one of the things that has been holding them back. But, um, you know, actually, oddly enough, I mean, w- the one time that they got to the red zone um, with Zach, you know, obviously, or I guess in that, uh, maybe, they, maybe they weren't technically in the red zone, but you get the point. I mean, they, um, they, they have a nice play with Zach Ertz. For the tu- you know they f- for the touchdown and that w- that was even an underthrown ball that that that, that could have been thrown better and would have been an even easier touchdown, um, but you know nevertheless I mean it was a nice play there by Zach Ertz um, and then of course that short drive after the you know the muffed punt uh, or I guess the the bobbled punt that you know I, I guess the punt that would never be a punt I guess since it was just bobbled and the Eagles came up with it. Um, you know, kind of starting in the red zone there. At least they didn't go um, three and out or anything. I mean, they went to fourth down, but they, you know, they got, they converted the fourth down and they they scored right there. So, um, you know, I guess that was a, a good thing. You know, if, if there's any anything to take away from this offense is that um, when they were actually in the red zone, which was again, it was pretty rare, um, they. They came out on top, and that's uh, maybe that's a good sign here. If they can move the football again against this Dallas defense, um, it's, maybe that plays in their favor. Maybe maybe the Eagles' offense they can be a little more diverse, I guess, in this this game against Dallas than they were here. I mean, because this is a game. I mean, it, it, again, I mean, I'll, I'll go through the scenarios in the I guess the last uh, segment here um, before we close down the show for the. Uh, I guess the, the the well the semester you know the the winter the rest of January and everything um, in December we'll go through the scenarios there but um, you know this is a game that you know you don't want to lose I mean obviously uh, it, it puts the Cowboys in the driver's seat and you know obviously the Cowboys they could they could always turn right around and lose to the Colts at home the next week because you know for whatever reason the Cowboys are not very good at home this year and um, it seems like whatever decent team or, or better comes in there um, this year they, they beat the Cowboys but um, but that, then again that's that's not the point I mean the, it should not come down to that for this Eagles team and I, I think that's that's the uh, that's the idea here I mean you don't um, this is a team that was supposed to win the division this year or whatever, and even though they're, I don't see them making a deep playoff run and getting past Seattle or the Green Bay Packers, I mean, that's not the point here. I mean, you know, we, we've seen some some progress in, in some regards this season, and, uh, you know, you'd like them to continue that progress. And whether it's finishing 11-5 and five and missing the playoffs or, or not, I mean, that's – I mean, regardless – That'd be disappointing if they, if uh, you know the Dallas Cowboys, they let the Dallas Cowboys win this division. Um, that you know, to me, that would be a, a big disappointment. And I, that, that's the point here. If they lose this game to the Cowboys, you know, they kind of let the Cowboys control their own destiny here, and that's uh, you know, that's a bit unfortunate. And that's uh, you know, again, that could come back to bite them. So, you know, we'll, we'll have more on that later um, coming up in the, the final minutes here on the, on the show. Um, so, so stay tuned for that. And if you want to get in, you know, quick before we close down the show, I mean, 610-683-4859 is always the number to get in or at facebook.com slash Tyler Werner show. If you want to post something, post a thought on this, uh, this game coming up this week. So we'll have, uh, we'll have that on the other side. Maybe we'll have a little Chip Kelly press conference, um, on this, uh, times yours Tuesday, I guess we call it right here on the Tyler Werner times show. Yours on Kutztown Radio. It's Telescopic Topics, a look into the world above us. If you've ever gotten the chance to see a shooting star in the night sky, did you ever wonder what you were really looking at? 
A shooting star is actually a small meteor that is rapidly moving and burning up due to entering Earth's atmosphere. Meteors come from remaining comet debris and fragments from damaged asteroids in the asteroid belt. To differentiate between these solar system bodies, a comet is a small object that orbits the sun and may display a coma and a tail if close enough to the sun. An asteroid is also a small object that orbits the sun but does not display a coma. It is usually made up of rock and metal. A meteoroid is a small rock or debris in our solar system. A meteor is a meteoroid that burns up while passing through the Earth's atmosphere, which produces a streak of light, and a meteorite is a meteoroid that endures falling through Earth's atmosphere and colliding with its surface. Each year, the Earth travels through these trails of debris and fragments from comets or asteroids, which class with our atmosphere. Here they shatter and create the bright and colorful rays in the sky, which we know as falling or shooting stars. Put a bunch of these shooting stars together and you get a meteor shower. During a meteor shower, meteors emanate at a spot in the sky on a specific date every year due to Earth passing through an area of particles at the same location in its orbit. The shower is named after the constellation where the meteors radiate at. The specific meteor shower that I will discuss occurs around August 12th and 13th every year. This meteor shower gets its name from the constellation of Perseus. The Perseids are known as the best meteor shower of the year with up to 100 meteors per hour and a meteor velocity of about 37 miles per second. Perseids leave long paths of light and color as they shoot across the Earth's atmosphere and also contain fireballs, which are even brighter and larger bursts of light and color. The Perseids are best observed in the northern hemisphere around late evening or before dawn. The creation of Perseids derived from the comet 109P Swift-Tuttle with its comet particles colliding with our atmosphere every year. This comet takes 133 years to orbit the sun one time. So the next time you look up into the night sky and see a shooting star, you'll now know what it really is, in short, a shooting meteor. Telescopic Topics, a look into the world above us. Stay tuned to KUR for more telescopic topics. And for more information, or to hear this segment again, click on the Telescopic Topics icon on the KUR website at www.kutztown.edu slash KUR. Telescopic Topics is a production of the KU Physical Sciences Department and is recorded by KU Astronomy students in the studios of KUR. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. And this is kind of what Tiger Woods sounded like in that press conference the other day. Yeah. That hoarse voice. and Yeah. Yesterday I did pull out. But apparently that uh, that fever and that nausea and everything else, or I guess whatever whatever was wrong with Tiger Woods. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, that was Tiger Woods. But, uh, you know, the other day in the press conference after that, I guess returning to the golf for the first time in a few months, um, but I guess uh, continuing to struggle, you know, kind of, I guess kind of picking up where he left off. Um, but uh, I guess in other news is uh, the Flyers game is coming, uh, I guess, to the, I guess the first period is coming to an end here. Um, I just checked in, and it looks like the, the Blue Jackets struck first with a goal, but the Flyers answered right back, and it's tied right now, uh, one-to-one as that game rolls on. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Hopefully uh, hopefully the Flyers can uh, maybe pull it out late here in the game and take a lead maybe. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. But uh, 1-1, it seems like they got a, an, inter- an interesting game going right now there with the Blue Jackets. Oh, my God. Um, so, so, yeah, that's uh, – if anything hap- – I, I guess any anything happens in the last couple minutes here, the period, we'll – I guess we'll try to update you there on that. Um, now, uh, like I mentioned last week, there was uh, – you know, again, I mean, the nightmare scenario I, I kind of brought up last week. There are a bunch of different scenarios that could have happened, but obviously, um, I think after what happened this past week, obviously, I think it's clear, at least on Seattle's end, that they're going to finish strong. I mean, Seattle, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, they, they at least go two and one their last few games and at least finish 11 and five. Um, I mean, I could see them winning out. Um, now, they got. Arizona at Arizona this this coming or I'm sorry they got San Francisco first which at this point I think you know the, the, I'm I'm pretty sure they'll handle them easily um, with the way that you know that the San Francisco franchise you know the the Jim Harbaugh era down there as we know it 
uh, for all we know is, you know, might just be, might, might have just come and gone for all we know. And, and, uh, yeah, they just, they just, uh, they're not going to do anything the rest of the season, it seems like. And, um, I, I think Seattle pro- probably beats them. And they, the week after that, they got Arizona at Arizona. Um, so that, you know, that could be an interesting game. Um, but certainly with the way that the Seahawks played on the road against the Eagles, you know, um, that's still winnable for them. And then uh, they got the Rams the last week. The Rams, you know, another another shut, you know, back to back shutouts here for the Rams the past couple of weeks. Um, now, granted, it was against the Raiders and the Redskins, but but still, the Rams' defense um, has been pretty, you know, pretty impressive as of late, and you know, just blowing teams out. Um, certainly, they've, uh, you know. Th- they're a team. They're a team that you never know when they could deliver an upset. But you know, one of them, they did upset the Seahawks earlier this season, and of course the Broncos a couple, you know, a few weeks ago. So, um, but I would think that you know, I would think that the Seahawks wouldn't lose two two games to the Rams, especially now with the revenge situation for them and just the Rams being a, or I'm sorry, the, the Seahawks now kind of playing on all cylinders. Um, you know, I, I would think that um, Seattle probably wins that second game, but but you never know. So um, you know, as far as that you know that goes, I mean, I, I think the the possibility of the Eagles getting a a second seed now, a first round by, I think are 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 pretty slim now. Um, but you know, I guess I guess you never know. I mean, if the Eagles win this Sunday, obviously um, that makes things you know seem better for them, but. Uh, I, I think it's when it's also at the end of the day. I think it's going to be tough for um, the Eagles to get a second seed at this point. Um, so, you know, so that's where I see that. Now, um, let's. I guess we'll listen into a little bit of this press conference from Chip Kelly the other day. Um, I guess see how you know as they as they turn the page here and look to look to you know bounce back at home this week and and beat Dallas um, once again as Dallas looks to come in for revenge. Chip, after looking at the film, did you any any um, big picture stuff you could see from the offense that just uh, didn't allow you to get into a rhythm? No, that we didn't get into a rhythm, and I think that was the biggest thing. You know, sometimes we had an opportunity. First drive, we're three and out. Um, you know, two pass plays that we, we, we missed in close coverage, and then third down, we were just short on the conversion. Next drive, we scored. Then we started driving. I think it was our third possession, but, we, you know, we get to a – we throw a pass on first and ten, it's second and ten, and then we have a, a six-yard loss on a run play because there's a miscommunication up front, so now you're behind. You know, we were obviously in too many third and longs all day long to, uh, you know, to, to put yourselves in successful situations. It's a lot easier when it's third and medium and third and short, but we were in too many, way too many third and longs uh, yesterday. I think ten of, of your <coughs> drives were uh, two minutes or less in game mm-hmm. clock. When you're in a, in a game like that going up against a defense and the offense isn't generating, you ever think of taking the foot off the pedal from a tempo standpoint to, uh, to give no, a break? No, I've never – time of the play don't matter. I mean, I, you could take five minutes to run three plays and go off the field. I mean, you have to execute and stay on the field. It's about plays run. I've always said that. So I've never – the time of possession thing, I don't understand that concept. If you can take the clock down to one second on the clock and then don't convert on first down, so you, you use three minutes of the clock, but they're still going to go back out on the field. So that, that's got nothing to do with it, and I don't think our – I've never been around it. I don't understand that. It's plays run. We ran 45 plays. They ran 85 plays. If you tell me we didn't run enough plays, we certainly didn't run enough plays. But we need to run more plays. That means we need to convert on third down. We also defensively have to get them off the field on third and 13 and third and 15. It's the same thing. You know, we gave up too many third and longs. We couldn't convert our third and longs, and they did a good job of converting theirs. You know, Russell kept some plays alive. So it's, it's always been plays run for me. How much did it hurt when the officials missed the ineligible receivers downfield? It just it happens, you know. I made bad calls yesterday too, but it's it's just part of the game. So, was there anything you would have done differently from a scheme game plan uh, perspective after watching the film offensively? <laughs> no, we just need to execute. You know, when you go back through it, it's it's they they do a good job. They they don't fool you with anything they do. They line up and they play football, and they're really really good at doing that. So, you know, you don't go back and look at it and say, hey, we should have run trap or we should have run this scheme it's it's they executed and we didn't execute how did the o-line grade out 
was it about what you expected or better? Yeah, no, I mean, nobody on offense played very well. You know, it was the entire group. You know, the whole the whole lot of us, coaches, players, whatever. We didn't we didn't have a very successful day on offense. So, Chip, you mentioned the third and longs defensively. Um, you guys have allowed eight third and fifteen conversions this year too. Yesterday, mm-hmm. um, eight out of twenty four of those situations. Yeah. Um, any, any idea why that is? I mean, it's th- different games, but I think obviously Wilson kept plays alive with his feet. You know, and he's obviously the the most dynamic quarterback from keeping things alive that we've faced so far this year and, and uh, that was a big part of it we felt like we you, you know there's a couple of times you think you got him and then um, he's out of it and he, he extends the drive and gives, a, gives time more time obviously you got to hold coverage a lot better we talk about plastering and coverage when the quarterback's scrambling um, but it, that's a long time to hold coverage if, you, if you're not getting to him normally with another quarterback you're, you're getting into him and, and in other games those have been sacks for us but that was a difference and I think he was a difference in converting those third downs so. so when you uh, look back at Thanksgiving going into Sunday do you, do you go back to that or is it just a whole new start against Dallas I mean we just had the two games we had our game and we had the uh, Chicago game that they played last Thursday and as we start the game playing because there's two more games for us to, to add into it you know obviously before we played Dallas we had the the whole season going up until that point but we have two more games to add in terms of how they defended us the first time we played them and then how they defended Chicago this past Thursday so that will factor into our decisions. Were there, were there more than usual opportunities for Ertz and Matthews that were open but the ball just didn't get there or wasn't, wasn't thrown their way? More than usual? No I wouldn't say more were than there, usual there, no. Did you see yeah there, there, there was a few times yeah. Did you, did you, did you, could you see what the basis of what, why the, the ball wasn't there or what Mark was Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes he got to the top of his drop and the four-man rush got to him. You know, we missed a couple blocks up front, so there's always a different factor on each opportunity. So. Chip, what did you see on the uh, interception Sanchez threw in Cooper's direction? Did you find those two are having some trouble hooking up since Sanchez is... No, that was... Uh, I, I, I don't... I, some, Derek just asked me about that question. I mean, well, uh, he got pushed off the point. That, that Cooper's exactly where he needed to be. The ball's thrown behind him, so... In the fourth quarter, did you think your offense had the right demeanor? It just seemed like there wasn't a lot of fire, a lot of, uh, you know, you're still in the game, but it sure didn't look like it from the way the offense approached. Yeah, I mean, I, we didn't execute in the fourth quarter. I think I can answer that question for you. So we didn't execute now. All right, so there was uh, some interesting, uh, I guess, statements from Chip Kelly. Of course, that one uh, interception from Mark Sanchez that was thrown behind Riley Cooper and everything. And, yeah, I mean, trouble hooking up and and this and that I, I don't know it seems like of course that Dallas the first Dallas game they you know they had a bit of that argument and we talked about that last week and um and everything but but yeah so uh you know a couple thoughts there as they look forward to you know I guess playing Dallas once again this time at home um now you know just to you know again give a Another like final idea, I guess, of what what's at stake here um, in the you know I guess the uh, the nightmare scenario update as to um, you know I, I guess what the Eagles are, are facing here if they if they don't win against the Cowboys this week, um, I guess give a little update of that. Basically, you know if they lose to Dallas, they you know. Maybe they win the last two division games against the Redskins and the Giants. I, I would, I, you would hope and expect that they do. Um, and the, you know, essentially that the Eagles finish eleven and five. Then, but again, Dallas finishes. They beat the Eagles, and then if they beat the Colts, um, which you know, again, they could lose that game. But say they beat the Colts, and then they beat that, they beat the Redskins the last game of the year. Obviously, they finish twelve and four. Eagles finish 11 and 5. Dallas wins the division. And then you got obviously a bit of a situation because the Cardinals just need to win one more game out of their next three. Um, uh, Whether that be Seattle um, or, you know, maybe the Rams or whoever else. uh, You know, I I don't know. All they have to do is win one more game. And more likely than not, they're going to be in the playoffs as a whether it be a wild card or division winner. Um, Seattle, I'm sure, will finish two and one. I don't see them finishing any worse than eleven and five at this point. So that puts them there. And then, yeah, I mean, other than that, that you know, that puts them a wild card spot. At, you know, at worst, um, along with Arizona. And then, yeah, again, that leaves Detroit. Um, now let's uh, just to see here. I'll. I'll I, I'm not sure exactly what Detroit's schedule is, so we'll uh, 
So as far as their schedule goes, just to paint the picture here, they they host the Vikings this week. Um, you know, they probably they, they can win that game. Um, and then at Chicago, uh, they could win that game as well. And then their last game is at the Packers, which they'll probably lose that game. Packers out for revenge, and they're probably out to clinch home field advantage. Um, I would think the Packers finish strong here and and win that division. So Detroit finishes probably 11 and five here. Um, I mean, I don't know unless they they lay a couple eggs and finish 10 and six. Um, but I would I would think I would think that they they can probably you know hosting Minnesota they can beat them and at Chicago I mean Chicago is not very good obviously so um, so that would leave Detroit with a pretty good conference record and probably a wild card spot and um, like I said Arizona uh, we go you know get their schedule up quick um, of course they have let's see they have. All right, they have at at St. Louis this week, which could actually be a loss. Um, actually, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Rams win that game at all. Um, and then they host the Seattle Seahawks, and then at 49ers, they'll probably beat the 49ers. Um, you know, either way, you know, regardless of what happens against the Rams or the Seahawks, all they have to do is win one more game, which I'm sure they will. They'll finish 11 and five at worst, and um, so. They're ba- they're playoff bound certainly, and Seattle, like I said, uh, they're they're playoff bound. I'm sure they'll go two and one at worst. Uh, but then again, I could I could see them running the table here the rest of the way and going uh, three and zero oh and finishing twelve and four, um, getting that second seed maybe or um, you know perhaps maybe the Packers lose one. I don't know if that'll happen. Um, perhaps they even get home field advantage again. I don't know, but. We'll see how it all plays out, and uh, and you know, unlike the, the past few months, uh, we won't be here to talk about it on the Tyler Warner Show next week. But um, you know, with whatever happens the rest of the season here, um, whether it be the Eagles, um, you know, making the playoffs, maybe winning a game in there, who, who knows? Or maybe, like I like the nightmare scenario could suggest, maybe losing, you know, not making the playoffs at all. You know, we'll talk about it. Um, as we uh, return, it, you know, come uh, I'm sure February, um, right here on Kutztown Radio. So, you know, everybody have a good holiday week, and uh, and also we hats off to uh, Tyler Fleming for producing the show throughout the fall. Thanks, Tyler, for contributing, and uh, yeah, certainly you're you're more than welcome to uh, produce once again if you so choose um, coming up in the spring. So uh, yeah, with that in mind. Have a good holiday season, everybody. A happy new year, and we'll talk to you um, come February right here on Kutztown.